الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to another installment of our weekly series analyzing the address where we revisit the day's khutbah talk about it in a little bit additional detail provide additional content and context that we were unable to provide given the time constraints of the khutbah and offer you an opportunity to ask any questions and provide any feedback that you so choose and the title of today's khutbah brothers and sisters was the path to certainly I'm sorry the path to certainty one knowing Allah through his names and attributes and we open the khutbah by mentioning that we are living in a time when many muslims are experiencing religious uncertainty and we said that that is because they are having a hard time reconciling current events and scientific knowledge and or personal experiences with the doctrine of religion and we mentioned this religious uncertainty in the context of muslim communities but we just want to be clear that this is not something which is exclusive to muslim communities but in fact it is something which is quite common perhaps even more common in other faiths so more and more people around the globe are becoming less religious and inclining more toward atheism uh agnosticism or unfettered spirituality so basically every person creates their own path to god and they call it spirituality not religion is not governed by any specific um organized and formal teachings but again unfettered spirituality you do what you do which makes you feel at peace with yourself all of these are very common alternatives uh to religion and we talked about how this religious uncertainty often traces its roots back to basically three things one or more of the following So one is current events. What do we mean by current events? We mean things like natural disasters. We mean things like uh humanitarian crises. We mean things like uh the global pandemic that we're experiencing right now. And basically these current events what they do is they cause some people to basically say that there is no god. How can there be a god and these, you know, horrible things are happening? Humanitarian crises these natural disasters which kill you know hundreds of thousands of people disease famine drought um or in the case of the pandemic which has uh, adversely affected the health of tens of millions and has killed um a large number of people throughout the world so they say this is proof that there just there can't be a god or they say there is a god but that god is cruel that god is malicious that god is mean spirited etc so this is what the place that these current events put some people in and it creates for them that religious uncertainty or even sometimes a conviction that religion is wrong the second one that we mentioned was scientific knowledge and basically um there are people who have concluded or they'll make statements uh indicative of this conclusion for example they will say that religion and science are incompatible believing in one necessitates disbelieving in the other they just come to this conclusion and so basically because we live in a time and we live particularly in a place where western intellectualism western empiricism is basically considered absolute truth by some people then what naturally happens if you believe in this premise that religion and science are incompatible believing in one that says they just believe in the other and you are just totally enamored with western empiricism then what will you do western empiricism scientific knowledge science will win your heart and religion will lose it and so this is what is happening to many people they feel that they're unable to reconcile between scientific knowledge and their beliefs and so they end up rejecting their beliefs and following scientific knowledge. The third one we mentioned was personal experiences. What do we mean by personal experiences? We mean things like trauma. One example of personal experiences is trauma. And trauma can come in different forms. For example, the death 
of a loved one is trauma. Some people, they lose a loved one and they blame God. They question God's wisdom and they lose their faith as a consequence or their faith is greatly shaken by that. But how could Allah let this happen? And the fact that Allah let this happen means that um, Allah is non-existent, he doesn't exist, he's not merciful, or he's cruel, he's insensitive, etc. Uh, another example of trauma is a life-altering illness or injury. You may have a person, for example, who is in an accident and they lose a limb. A person uh, isn't, has a fall and they have memory loss. A person has a fall and they actually lose their eyesight as a consequence. So this loss of a limb, this injury or illness which alters the course of their life makes them question God's wisdom, God's mercy, etc. and therefore create religious uncertainty. Another example of trauma is the dissolution of a relationship. So for example, divorce uh, can be a reason and the all of the consequences of divorce can be something which can cause a person to begin to question, to fall into a deep depression and question, why am I religious? Why am I giving my life to a religion when God let this happen to my relationship, etc. And another example of personal experiences uh, is religious inconsistencies. That some people, their experience with religion is a poor one. And as a consequence, they begin to doubt or have uncertainty, at the very least, uh, about the religion. And some people go to the extent of just rejecting religion altogether. They're not just uncertain and they remain religious, but they actually reject religion altogether. So, for example, they may read and study uh, parts of the Quran, for example. And they come across verses. And then they compare what they read in the verse and what they understand the implication of the verse to be. And they compare that with their actual life experience and they find an inconsistency. And as a consequence, they begin to doubt the faith, to doubt the truthfulness, for example, in this case, of Allah's word. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'innu al qulub He says, is it not the case, certainly, the hearts feel rest with the dhikr or through the dhikr, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a person who reads this and then remembers Allah and doesn't find that sakina, doesn't find that tumatnina, doesn't find that, uh, that peace, that calm, that tranquility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing in this. If they don't find that, or they don't find it the way they envision it to be or that it should be, then they will say, this is not consistent. Allah said it's going to be like this. It wasn't like that. So therefore, Allah is not truthful or religion not truthful. I should doubt the Quran, doubt Allah's words, etc. Another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِ يَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ And your Lord says, call upon me, I will answer your prayer. So here Allah is promising that if we pray to Him, He will answer our prayer. He will give us what we ask for. And so people will pray, and they won't get what they're asking for. They understand the ayah to mean, maybe they, for example, mean, they, they, they understand to mean that they'll get instant gratification. That they'll get on their knees and they'll raise their hands and ask Allah for something. They should turn to their left and it should be right there. They might understand it like that. Or they may not understand what Allah means when He when He says that He will answer. They, they think that whatever I ask for, I will get exactly that thing, etc. And so when they don't get exactly what they what, that thing, or they don't get it in a timely way, manner. For example, they expect that it should come within this amount of time. If it doesn't come in that amount of time, that duration of time passes and it doesn't come, they assume Allah is not telling the truth. There's a religious inconsistency. So these are examples of the three categories that we mentioned or alluded to in the khutbah, uh, current events, scientific knowledge, and personal experiences that can create these uh, instances of religious uncertainty. And we mentioned that this um, of inability to reconcile between these three major categories is something which can occur to Muslims of all ages and walks of life. And we said that this is especially true for uh, Muslims 
who are my Muslim minorities living in Western countries like here in America. Right, because the dynamics around us, the environment is not conducive for religious commitment, religious certainty. We, our religion is under siege, religion in general and Islamic religious beliefs in particular. And then we said it's even more especially true for Muslim youth, and particularly those Muslim youth who are attending secular schools and universities. And so we have to understand that our youth, brothers and sisters, are experiencing any number of these forms of religious uncertainty at any, at, I'm sorry, at an extremely high level. And it is therefore important for us to recognize this and address it for a number of reasons. And I'll mention a few of them on Oja. One of the reasons why we have to really, really, um, really, really address and focus on the youth. One of the reasons, not to mean not, not, not doesn't mean we should ignore the adults and the religious uncertainty that afflicts adults. But one of the reasons why we should focus more attention on the youth is because adults generally, typically, they hang in there. Adults typically hang in there. Why? Sometimes they hang in there because of conviction. It doesn't matter to me that I can't answer every question about Islam. I'm convinced that Islam is the truth. And if there's a question I can't answer, it's because of a fault in me. And in my knowledge, in my understanding, it's not a fault in Islam. Many adults are like that. There are questions that they have about Islam that they, they don't necessarily know the answer to. They ask and they don't find the answer that satisfies them, but they still remain convinced because they, they still remain Muslim because they're convinced. I'm convinced Islam is true. And if there are things that I perceive to be false, it's because of me, not because of Islam. Some of them hang in there because of tradition. I mean, I've always been Muslim. My mother and father were Muslim. My, 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 my people been Muslim for what? For centuries. I'm not going to leave my deen. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what doubts I have. Tradition keeps them in the deen. And some of them stay in the deen because of stubbornness. So adults, typically they hang in there. But young people are more impressionable. Young people, especially in the Western environment, are more impressionable. They are more likely to be, in, be, to be influenced by the environment and by their peers. So that's why we have to focus more attention on them. Another reason we have to focus more attention on the young people is because they are right now in their formative years and they're less influenced by tradition. They don't care what their parents are on. They don't care what their parents' parents are on. I'm going to live for me. I'm going to live my life for me, and I'm going to do what suits me. And so that's another reason why we have to, we have to work on the youth and stop thinking that, well, I'm Muslim. My, my children are going to inherit Islam from me. They're going to, of course, my, my children are going to be Muslim because I'm Muslim. This is a mistake that we make, and it's, uh, it's one of the tricks of the shaitan. There's a lot of good religious people, really committed religious people, and their kids aren't religious. Their kids aren't committed. Look no further if you want to look beyond us. Look at the prophets themselves. Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh alayhi salam was a messenger of God, one of the greatest messengers of God, and his son died a kafir, refused to, to mount the ark. And so we can't be fooled to believe that I'm Muslim, so my children are going to be Muslim. No, we're not going to be Muslim unless we put the work in, unless we focus on the youth. Another reason why to focus on the youth is because they are exposed to more challenges than us, than the adults. Their faith is challenged more than adults, than the faith of an adult is. Especially those, as we said earlier, they go to these secular schools and universities. They're almost always confronted with so many things that challenge what they're supposed to believe or what they, on what they know they're supposed to believe. They're always challenged more than we are. Many of us will go to work and some of us don't even really associate with our coworkers. We go to work, we do our job, we don't have a lot of conversations, interaction with them that, hasn't, that doesn't have anything to do with work. And so we don't get these conversations where our faith is challenged. We're not watching and reading or forced to watch and read things that will make us question what we believe in. But our children are. They go to school and they have classmates. They go to school, they have teachers, they have textbooks. They have different assignments that they have to read, research that they have to do that expose them to ideas which contradict what they believe in. 
And so they're challenged more often than we are. So we have to focus more on the youth because of that. And also, last but not least, young people are the future of Islam. And if they are confused, if our young people are confused, and they remain Muslim, but they have this confused idea about what Islam is, and they try to, in their own, of their own volition, they try to basically reconcile in their own way, not in a way that's guided by the teachings of the deen and the principles of the deen, but they just decide, look, I'm going to take from here, I'm going to take from here in the way that satisfies me, and I'm going to espouse that as religion. Then those people are going to take this corrupt, confused, mixed up version of Islam and pass it on to the next generation. How can we prevent this from happening? By focusing on the youth and removing these doubts and helping them understand Islam correctly in this most purest and pristine form. And answer those doubts in a way where they're satisfied, they're convinced, and they're able to transmit Islam to the following generation in a convincing manner as well. And then we went on the khutbah, and we said that because faith is the cornerstone of religious commitment, doubt is the greatest threat to it. And therefore, ridding ourselves of doubt and achieving the opposite certainty should be our number one priority. It should be our number one priority. Why? Because at the, found, the foundation of faith, the foundation of faith, I'm sorry, the foundation of religious commitment, I should say, is faith. And if you have a weak foundation, your faith is weak, then the religious commitment is going to do what? It's going to come crashing down. So what we have to do is remove the doubt that makes the foundation of faith shaky. We have to remove that doubt. So our religious commitment stands what? Stands firm. And this is especially true, this is something that, who has to, who has to understand this message? Who has to understand this message? Everybody has to understand it, but particularly the scholars, the imams, the Muslim evangelicals, the teachers in Islamic schools, and other mentors in the Islamic communities. All of them must understand this and dedicate a good amount of their attention and their resources to two things. One, to qualify themselves to address these doubts. They have to be qualified. If they sit with a, a young person, and that person says, no, I, don't, you know, I don't know if I believe in Islam anymore. And you say, why? And he starts saying things like, well, look at, look at what's going on in the world. We got a global pandemic. We got you know, these war-torn countries where there's these humanitarian crises as a consequence. You have people who are dying from diseases that are curable. You have this going on and that going on. And I just don't see how a merciful God would let this happen. And the person responds, and there was their response is, look, man, you just need to believe. You just need to believe. That's not going to cut it. That is not going to cut it. And some people do feel incapable of answering these questions. They feel that they're unable to empathize because they themselves don't have these problems. They don't have any issue with faith. They have no issue with faith whatsoever. I'm convinced. Go back to what we talked about earlier, how adults, they just have conviction. I don't have, to, I don't have to understand why there's evil, why there's suffering. I don't have to understand that. And the fact that I don't understand it is not going to make me doubt my religion. You have, that's, that, but that's not going to work for this young person. And so if we don't have the tools to answer these questions, then we need to go and get the tools. We may need to spend money to go and get trained on how to answer these questions. And it may even mean that we have to go to uh, classes and seminars conducted by people of other faiths who are who have basically they have a, a long history and experience, you know, a wealth of experience in, 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 for example, answering atheism, for example, answering agnosticism and refuting these religious doubts. But that's the first thing that we have to do as scholars and imams and community leaders and, you know, mentors in the community, we have to qualify ourselves. And even if it means spending money, but that, us, us thinking that, you know, I'm, you know I don't want to handle this. Man, look, you, you Muslim or not, you need to believe. Your parents are Muslim, you got to be Muslim, you got to believe. That ain't, that's not going to cut it. The second thing that we need to do 
is implement a plan to do so effectively. So we've got the training, we've spent the resources, we've done what we had to do to qualify ourselves to answer these doubts, to refute these doubts. Now we have to implement a plan. We have to have a plan. What's our plan? What's our strategy to deal with our youth? To guide our youth back, to, to, to infuse in them, to ingrain in them a, a level of certainty and religious commitment that is unshakable. We have to have a plan. We have to have a plan for our youth. But then after that, in the khutbah, we asked the question, we said, what are the paths to achieving certainty, which is centrally important to the preservation of faith and the removal of the doubts that undermine it? And so here, I kind of alluded to the fact that there are several paths. It's not just one path. There are several paths to certainty, several paths that will enable us to attain and achieve religious certainty, religious conviction. And it is my hope that in the coming Fridays, we will talk about some of these different paths. Why? Because we need to have a number of tools in our tool belt. When we, when we face, as adults or as youth, when we face religious uncertainty, we got to have different tools in our tool belt to be able to what? To deal with the problem, to fix the problem. And so it doesn't make sense to give you, give you one tool because when, if the situation changes, that tool might not be the most effective tool to use in that situation. So we want to give our community members and those who follow our, our lives, we want to give them all these tools so that they can use them in their respective communities and their respective households. So the one that we mentioned today was knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Truly knowing him by reflecting upon and contemplating his names and attributes. And this is the path that we chose to spoke about in today's khutbah. And we gave two examples of that in the khutbah because we didn't have time to give a number of examples. And the two examples we gave was one, we said, if we just reflect upon Allah's names generally, and you can pick any name, you can just start reading the Quran or you read a book which is compiled, there are some books out there where they've compiled the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the Quran and from the Hadith. You start reading the Quran and you read one of these books and you just pick any name. What are you going to notice from all of the names? What do they all have in common? They all, they all smack of perfection, magnificence, exceptionalism, uh, in, the, the, the impeccableness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we gave some examples in the khutbah of some of those names. And what we take from that, in addition to it creating in us a sense of love and awe for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, veneration for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it also creates and fosters in us the conviction, going back to certainty and conviction, that his actions and his decree are as perfect as he is. He's perfect, and everything he does is perfect. Everything he decrees is perfect. And what that does is we confront uncertainty in the form of the presence of a decree that we don't understand, that doesn't make sense to us, and to us it seems flawed. We're able to push away that religious uncertainty created by that circumstance, because why? We know Allah is perfect, and we know that whatever he decrees and whatever he does is perfect. And the imperfection is not in him or his decree, but it's rather the imperfection is in our perception, the way we perceived his decree, because he is perfect without fault. And we mentioned the ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anbiya, he says, لا يسألوا ما عما يفعل وهم يسألون. He is not to be questioned about what he does, but rather they are to be questioned. They ought to be questioned. They ought to question themselves. Why? Because he's perfect. So this will help. This is a very helpful tool. You can see how the names generally help us to achieve certainty. Then we gave a more specific example. We said that if we take those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which talk about how he's all powerful, absolutely capable, he is, uh, he can do whatever he wants. And we couple that with the names which indicate that he is absolutely knowledgeable. He's all knowing and all wise. We take from that 
we put that together and we look at things like, for example, the existence of evil, the existence of suffering, the existence of hardships in the world, like we talked about earlier about current events and how that affects and shakes some people's certainty or religious conviction or religious, uh, yeah, that it creates for them, creates for them religious uncertainty. Well, when that happens and we look at these things and we look at it in the light of these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these attributes of Allah, we're able to see that this evil, it exists, this suffering exists, this hardship exists, not because Allah is incapable of preventing it from occurring in the first place or removing it once it's occurred. Why? Because he's all capable. He can do anything. He can do whatever he wants. Nothing can stop him. And he's all-knowing and all-wise, which means that it exists. He allows it to exist. He permits it to exist because in his wisdom or his wisdom dictates that it exists. And we might not understand it, but that's because we don't have his level of wisdom. And he knows that this is the existence of this evil or suffering or hardship is good for us, even though we can't see how it is so. And we mentioned the ayah in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, عَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرُّ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلُوا أَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ It is possible that you dislike a thing and it is good for you. And it's possible that you like a thing and it's bad for you. Allah knows what is good and what is bad for you and you do not know. And how many times in life has something that you consider to be bad, it happened to you? And then in retrospect, after some time passed and everything played out and the dust settled, you said, you know what? That was good for me. I'm glad that happened. I'm glad that happened. How many people got divorced and they thought, man, this is the worst thing that could happen to me. And then after they, they got divorced, they found their soulmate. And then they look back. They're with a person who is the yin to their yang. This person completes me. This person loves me. He honors me. He, she treats me like a king. He treats me like a queen. And you say to yourself, that divorce was the best thing that happened to me. I hated it at the time, but it turned out to be what? To be good for me. How many people can say that? A lot of people can say that. How many people had an accident? And it, it seemed to turn their life upside down. But then they look back and rich. I'm so glad that accident happened to me. Because it led to this good thing and this good thing and this good thing. Lost a job. And thought that losing that job was the worst thing that could happen to them. And then they got a better job. And that's how it works. So we have to understand that Allah knows what's best for us. And we don't know. And these are a number of examples. And we, we could go on mentioning examples. And I did want to mention a few extra ones, but I don't want to make it too long. But you get the point. You get the point that if we reflect upon the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we reflect upon them properly and apply them to some of these, these, these creators of religious uncertainty, we'll find an answer and the religious uncertainty will be removed. And you can see the effectiveness of contemplating the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in creating and fostering al-yaqeen. Um, we mentioned at the end of the khutbah, we mentioned that brothers and sisters, we said our faith, is being challenged every day in ways that we may or may not recognize. And we mentioned that these challenges, they create fissures in our faith. And those fissures in our faith allow doubt to seep into our hearts through the cracks. And here, what are these challenges? These challenges can come in the form of spacious arguments, what we call shubuhat or dubious assertions. Again, shubuhat. Meaning that's, that, that's something that res, it, it seems like it's true on the face of it, but when you look deeper into it, you see it's not true. Well, this happens all the time in religion by people who are confused. They speak about religion, but they themselves are confused religiously. We confront these people. Sometimes we make a mistake and pick up one of their books and read it. Sometimes we open because, I mean, these internet sheikhs and Facebook sheikhs and Instagram sheikhs are everywhere. We open Facebook, we open YouTube, we open Instagram, and one of these guys is on, and we 
start watching, and next thing you know, he's saying things, and it creates what? Creates confusion. Shubuhat. So these are some of the challenges to our faith that we see, unfortunately, every day. Also, we have we come across questions that we ask ourselves, or questions that are asked of us, and we don't necessarily have the answer. And sometimes we're just exposed to things, and specifically we gave the example of our children in school, exposed to theologies and philosophies and theories about evolution and creation and so many other things that make us start to question what we believe in. And him, we went on to say in the khutbah that this is true for adults, but it's especially true for what? For the Muslim youth. Focused a lot or tried to focus a lot on the Muslim youth, especially those attending secular schools and universities. And here I just want to mention that many of our young people have not been adequately prepared to have their faith challenged. It's like a person who takes his child to a swimming pool or an ocean, takes him out to the deep end, and then throws him in and never taught him how to swim. This is what we are doing, and that is on us as parents, on us as community leaders and other mentors in the community. We're the ones who are doing this. We're the ones who are failing these kids because we haven't adequately prepared them to have their faith challenged. Our community programming, our, our community programming has to acknowledge this reality and address it properly. We can't just stick our heads in the sand and hope the problem of doubts goes away. Our children are saying things, they're asking questions that we don't feel comfortable answering, we wish they wouldn't ask them, and so we think well, we'll just ignore it and it'll go away. It's not going to go away because this is an ancient problem. This is not, I know it, it, seems, like, it seems like a new phenomenon in the 20th and 21st century, it seems like a new phenomenon because of all of the technological breakthroughs and because of the advancement of technology and knowledge and learning and science, we think that this is just new. People didn't doubt before. People just accepted. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Ahqaf. He mentions, he says, for example, وَالَّذِي قَالِ وَالِدَيْهِ وَالَّذِي قَالِ وَالِدَيْهِ أُفِّلْ لَكُمَا أَتَعِدَانِنِي أَنْ أُخْرَجَ وَقَدْ خَلَتِ الْقُرُونُ مِنْ قَبْلِي he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a young man who says to his parents, this is in the Quran, real to the Prophet over 1400 years, 1400 years ago. And the Prophet isn't talking about something that happened during his time, he's talking about what? Something that happened before. So this is ancient, doubt is ancient. A boy says to his, who his parents, I'm irritated, I'm tired, enough! I'm tired of hearing about religion. Do you promise me that I'm going to be resurrected? And generations before me have passed on, and I don't see anybody getting resurrected and coming out of their graves. And these two parents, they cry out to Allah for help. Woe to you, saying to their child, believe. Don't die a disbeliever. But he had doubt, because why? His personal experience, he, he, there was no material evidence for what they were asking to believe in, he couldn't bring himself to believe it. So doubt is something which is always oh, not going to go away. We can't just bury our heads in the sand and think our children are going to doubt. We can't do that. We have to confront this problem head on. And then at the end, we mentioned that this specific tool in our tool belt of reflecting on and contemplating the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide us with yaqeen and provide our youth with yaqeen if we sit with them and, and study these names and study how they can use them appropriately to show how they rebut these uncertainties. That this will provide us with a level of certainty and conviction. Not only that though, we said there's an, there's an additional benefit, there's an added benefit to, re, to contemplating and reflecting on these names and mention the hadith of al-Bukhari on the authority of Abu Hurairah, which the Prophet said, "Inna lillahi tis'atan wa tis'ina isman, mi'atan illa wahida, man ahsaha dakhla al-jannah." So we mentioned that hadith where the Prophet said, "Surely Allah has ninety-nine names, one hundred minus one. Whoever contemplates them will enter paradise." What does this contemplate mean? What does contemplate mean? Ahsaha, which literally means to enumerate them. What does it mean? It means. Three, it has three meanings or three levels. Three levels of enumerating. 
The first one is Hafibaha. The one who commits them to memory and knows these names by heart. So one level of Ihsa is taking those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actually trying to memorize them, committing them to memory. The second one is Ma'rifati Ma'rifati Ma'aniha is learning their meanings, learning what they mean, understand their meanings and their implications. And last but not least, and perhaps the most important of the three, is an amalu biha. That our actions should be influenced by these names. We should call upon Allah using these names. Ya Rahim, irhamni. O merciful one, have mercy upon me. Call upon Allah by these names. Use these names in our worship. Act in accordance with these names. Also, we seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We make a tawassul bihi. We seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through these names. And we swear by these names. We're going to swear. I swear this happened. We swear by these names. Right? Billah. I swear by Allah. Bi rahmatillah. I swear by Allah's mercy. Bi karamillah. I swear by Allah's generosity. And we... And our theology regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is informed by them. We believe in Allah in accordance with these names. We believe Allah is merciful because His name is Ar-Rahman, Dhu Rahma. He is the most merciful, the possessor, the bestower, I should say, of mercy. So we, our theology about Allah, He is a Saniya, the all-hearing. We believe Allah hears everything. There's no place we can go and no whisper that we can speak in that he won't hear us. He's al basir He's the all-seeing. There's no dark, moonless night cave we can enter, enter into and think that we can hide from the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on and so forth. And so these are the three levels of an ihsa and they're all intended by the hadith. And whoever does all three of these things for all of these names Dakhil al Jannah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from them. And with that, we'll bring uh, today's uh, session to a close. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as always to bless your houses, to bless your spouses, to bless your children, to bless you and to make you blessed wherever you may be. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who he teaches beneficial knowledge. And we truly allow us to benefit from that knowledge by makers from those who put it into practice. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak an Nabi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.